Hey, everybody, welcome once again to the podcast. Mike Claiborne here, and it's time to talk a little Billiken basketball with the voice of the Billikens, Bob Ramsey. We haven't done this in a while, Ramsey, because we haven't had a lot of games in succession, but we had a good one last night, and it was one that I think is going to be the indicator of how this team is going to have to be for the rest of the year. Man, you you kind of echo what Travis Ford says, Mike. Um, you've seen a couple games along the way, haven't you? Um, maybe maybe three. Uh, yeah, Travis said the, that it started at Saint, with St. Saint Bonaventure last week or last Saturday, and it's got to continue to be that way. Because you get into conference play, there's no surprises, and um, grinding it out is kind of what's always been a hallmark for Billiken basketball anyway. And so last night was a perfect example of that. Uh, the Billikens did not shoot the basketball well. They did not shoot well. Um, and early on, we're getting out rebounded. And Travis said, had a timeout and said, hey, we've got to we got to get back to who we are. And they did as the game went on. Then they were able to stretch out the lead. Big baskets um, led by Jordan Goodwin. You know, it was a real interesting adjustment made. Um, uh, Yuri Collins got hurt early and sat out most of the game. And he is that he's the little engine that makes it go. Right. And uh, Jordan Goodwin stepped over to the point guard role uh, for the rest of the game and uh had zero turnovers that zero. well that's that's the number that caught my eye what you have four turnovers for the whole game it's unbelievable i mean you know we've seen teams where they have four turnovers and two trips up and down the floor <laughs> i mean i mean it's it, it's so it's such a glaring number which tells me that a you, you took care of the ball and paid a little bit more attention but b uh, it said about a lot about your defense as well, I would think, uh, in, in the think fact so. that, that you had the ball more and you were able to guard and you didn't rush anything and you didn't make bad passes or just be careless. And it sounded to me that they were really focused in what they had to do last night, especially after losing a good player like Collins. Yeah, you know, and um, it, it was really interesting that Hassan French had been in a funk the last couple of games, mm -hmm. hadn't much, in foul trouble both games. He looked like Hassan French. Last night, double-digit rebounds. He and Jordan Goodwin had more than half of the 43 rebounds, and that's that's what they do. That's what they've done since the first day they walked onto campus is rebound, and uh, um, they really got got back to the core of, of who they are last night. Can you keep that intensity level up uh, the rest of the way? Well, you kind of have to. You're playing fewer games. Uh, so each game carries more weight, wins or losses. The wins are bigger. The losses are bigger uh, just because there's literally more value to each one. Hey, you, you know, obviously this is a hokey season. Um, for me, I'm not a believer in rankings at this point because not only are you in league play, but you have teams that walk out there now and they think they can get anybody no matter what their record may indicate or how people thought of them at the beginning of the year with the shutdowns or the pauses, whatever you want to call it. I, I think everybody's in play, which means when they tell me, well, he's their number 12 in the country, man, listen, that 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 doesn't wash here right. because anybody can be had on your home floor as well. And that's the other thing we're seeing. We're seeing good teams at home having problems with teams and maybe they didn't think were that good. But you know what? Guys show up now and say, well, why not? So how do you how do you deal with that? If you're if you're a basketball team, it was last night one of those eye openers where you say, all right, boys, you know, we're going to have to battle and button it down even more because this team thinks they can come in and win. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the Billikens are going to be challenged. You'd like to say, well, they just got to go win out. They're good. But going to VCU, going to Dayton, um, going to St. Bonaventure, you know, there's three games right there that you're not you're not afraid of them. But we all know those are really good teams and really tough venues, and you got to respect that fact as you go into it. So while it's it's fun to say we're good, let's go win them all. <laughs> you know, Travis is just worried about Saturday. I yeah. promise you, he's just worried about Saturday, and and uh, and they they've got to do whatever they can. And what's really going to be weird when you set up conference tournaments, everybody's going to be playing had played different mm -hmm. amounts of games. I presume that they're going to go just by uh, winning percentage as opposed to, you know, games behind and all that sort of thing. So the, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy all the way through. And I haven't heard any talk about it lately um, about the NCAA tournament expanding. 
Um, this might be a year where you could say as a one time, as a one time deal, yeah, we're going to have yeah. to do this because it is almost impossible to get fair evaluations apples to apples uh, with with teams and leagues this year. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Bob. I, I think that this is the one year where everybody's in the pool. Everybody gets a, gets a free swim and, you know, whatever happens, happens. Uh, you're going to have it in one place. Uh, and so what, what does that mean? So there are going to be some teams that are going to have one more night stay than somebody else or two more nights stay. Uh, I, I like the, I like the concept and, you know, and, and again, you said it best. It's a one shot deal. Let's not have a committee to explore this and doing this in the future, right. but everybody should have a shot to get in this thing and see what happens. And I know it may be a great story that if one of these teams from nowhere finds themselves in the second round or maybe the third round, but the cream always rises to the top in my opinion. But I, I like, I like what you're saying, man. And I hope they really consider it, especially because they can control it more, all of it being in one place. Yeah. I, the number I heard, but it's been a couple of weeks, so I don't know if it's still a hot topic, but was 128 teams. That was the number I okay. heard. Uh, that's good. And, I can uh, live with that. You know me, I'm I'm such a nerd on it. I was going through all the standings, and it's pretty easy to find 90 teams. You say, yeah, you know, what they've done this year is probably enough in an expanded playoff to get in. So 128, you'll have a lot of teams that are real, you know, you know, decent but so-so that probably have no legitimate shot at winning a national championship. But, hey, we're trying to be fair. Come on to the party. You know what I'd like to see? Um, because if we're going to include 128, and, and you're right, I think there's probably 90 teams that probably have something to play for. Maybe that back end group plays their own in, in play in tournament, and then they start to advance out of that. So we can eliminate some of the, you know, the gristle early uh within the tournament. So like I mean playing rounds. Yeah, exactly. And and you know what? If COVID brought us one thing, what the NBA did with the play-in round and watching the NHL have something similar to that, uh, I, I think creates hope. It creates an opportunity. And, again, you get a team on a hot streak that nobody's seen. And this is where – and, by the way, I'll, I'll ask you this question before I go any further. Are you seeing some good coaching or what? Because they don't have a lot of things to work with. Uh, you know, maybe they don't have as much video. They don't have guys who are in condition like they normally are, and they've kind of had to simplify things but continue to teach. I, I think what I'm seeing at St. Louis U and around the country is a remarkable job of what these coaches are doing and the coaching staffs. We've seen coaches who by this time in a normal year, um, their blood pressure is up. They're, uh, uh, they're sick all the time because they're up all night looking at tape and all those kinds of things. So in a normal year, stress is at a high level. Um, it'd be interesting to see if we could get the med medical community to run stress tests on these guys, <laughs> the beginning of the year, the middle, and the end. And they probably would fail all these head coaches by the time Mark rolls around. <laughs> but because of the extra stress put on, trying to keep your team focused and obviously like you would in any other year playing at the highest level possible. But I think, I think that has been challenged, you know, really ultimately. And now you, you, you know, sometimes in the past over the last 40 years in division one, I've wondered, okay, home environment, that's nice, but let's don't overdo it. I think I've been wrong all these years. The clubs, hmm. the, the, the schools that have a great home environment, where the fans are rowdy and raucous and it's a lot of noise and it's filled up, I think it does make a difference. I I think um, my level of respect for fans and school atmospheres, I think it's more important than I gave it credit for all these years. You, you know, and, and that's a great point you make. And if you're an athletic director and a coach and, and a spirit coordinator, whatever, this is a time for you to step back and realize how important this element is. Um, and it'll be interesting to see once we get back to something a little bit more familiar, what schools will do to bring that back. Because remember, you're going to have some kids that have never been in an environment like this before. Uh, when we start to play normal basketball, they're going to be, there's going to be a group of kids, a group of freshmen and sophomores 
who've never been in a hostile environment like what they may walk into Great and boys. how they deal with that is going to be very interesting Yeah, because they've been used to ba basically advanced pickup games with a few people in the stands yelling and screaming, but nothing mm -hmm. to the level of what you've seen in your career and what I've seen that I think there are going to be some people folding up like cheap suits if they don't have the, <laughs> the proper preparation. Well, here's the other thing. What do we do about the band? You know more, you know more about music than me. Can we spread them all around the arena instrument <laughs> by instrument? Does that mix? Is it too far apart? I, I think, you know, I think technology gives you a chance. Uh, you know, I think the question is, we don't want to give them too many good seats because we want to sell some too. Right. So, so, you know, and that's the other thing that schools are going to have to be conscious of uh, making sure that the primo seats are primo. But, you know, I think if you strategically place a band, let's say near the visitor's bench, like we see at Chaffetz, uh, that, that that's always an attention getter. Or, or where where what direction you go? Do you want noise if you're playing defense in the last quarter in the last ten minutes, or do you want noise if you're playing offense? You know, all those little things I think have to be reviewed when they come back to to getting something that we're accustomed to. Maybe you tell Doctor Chaffetz you can have that seat, but you got to play the trombone. Yeah, you got. To, <laughs> hey, buddy, bring a tambourine, do something, but you. You just can't sit there and yell and scream because that's going to get old. Yeah, that's a good point. We might want to check his music background. Sure. Hey, maybe a triangle. Sure. Maybe he has, yeah, he has. <laughs> so, hey, you know, um, th this Billiken team has been fascinating for a lot of different reasons. W what's been the one thing that stood out to you even after the pause took place that has been the consistent thing that has really made this team fun to watch? What's funny is they haven't been consistent, but when they play well, and my broadcast partner, Earl Austin Jr., has brought it up several times, is when the Billikens move the ball. And, and you would say that for any team, but specifically to this team, mm -hmm. it's night and day between how they look when they're a little bogged down where you get somebody trying to do too much of a one-on-one -on -one move and they've got the ball in their hand the whole possession. Um, that would be typical of virtually – any basketball team at any level. But with this team, it's a dramatic difference mm. between finding the open man with ball movement, having the that second guy hockey assist. There was a play last night where Goodwin had it up top. They found Hassan French under the basket, and he thought, and he was guarded, but he got a great position. But instead of going up and having it contested, it was almost a touch pass out to the wing because he saw that Gibson Jimerson was completely unguarded. And it was a better shot, and he hit a three. And it was, you know, it was like that. Two quick passes. The Billikens have enough talent. Can they score one-on-one? -on -one? You know how everybody now plays four out or sometimes even five out. Um, can they do that? Yes. But they're a dramatically more efficient offensive team when they move the basketball. Dramatically more, in a, more efficient. The other question here is how effective – you know, we have French and who went through a little bit of a slump scoring wise. How effective are they going to be below the free throw line? You mentioned they they move well without the ball. But, you know, when you get into tournament play and, and the teams really tighten up, you have to be able to find find someone who can make the open shot. But you better be able to pound it inside. And and maybe French gets a pass because they, they'll file him and not worry about it because he hasn't proven that he can make enough free throws. But they've got to have another option. Do they have another option below the free throw line when the games are really on the line and they need a foul? Absolutely. In fact, um, last night, because uh, uh, Rhode Island played a couple of bigs together, we kind of thought, would this be a night that we'd go back to seeing – either Jimmy Bell or Martin Linson start at the, at center with French at the four. And Travis proved that they didn't need to do that last night because he wanted, needed to guard the perimeter. Um, but with three bigs and Linson's a four or five, Jimmy Bell is a back to the basket center. Although don't sleep on Jimmy Bell because uh, he is so good with the ball in his hands at the high post, handling it and distributing it. Linson is so good, not just with his hands, but with his feet down low, that Travis has uh, three bigs that can contribute on a given situation on a given night. And Bell and Linson both hit their free throws. And, you know, that's that's a great point you make. And you've seen countless Billiken teams. 
maybe the best group of of, of big guys that, no that, that you know you've seen that that can do a little bit of everything. I mean, no you know, you know, we've seen guys Mike Ivester, Travis Tadasak, and then you thankfully you had Bonner, uh, and you've seen some other guys along the way. But in just your description alone, just tells me these guys may be as special as any group we've seen in the last 10, 12 years, minimum. The only one that I can think of that had three guys is uh, Banyak and Tatum and Heinrich, maybe. But that's that. And those yeah. guys were all good players and good contributors. But it's it's not the same. I mean, right. French, French is, is one of your top 20 players all time. Um, the numbers, he's your all time leading shot blocker already. Uh so um, I think I think this group is deeper. That's good to hear. All right, let's talk a little bit about what's coming up. Um, you've got a game on the road this weekend. Um, it, it seems like again, and I'm just I'm, I'm maybe having more fingers crossed than anything else that maybe the worst of COVID has has gone through. Obviously, the Billikens, but maybe the conference. But then again, you may get that one phone call, and all of a sudden you're back on ice again. But give me an idea of what they have in front of them as far as the games that are on the schedule as we speak. Well, as you know, you've got to beat Fordham. Um, Fordham's a bottom feeder. No offense to them. They know it. They're in a constant rebuild cycle. They play in the oldest gym in America, over 100 years old, Rose Hill Gym. Um, it's just – it's a funky place. I'm not trying to do a preemptive excuse strike. It's a true fact that you have to deal with. Um, good teams deal with it. Yeah. Good teams understand that it's a weird environment and you better be focused and you better not disrespect them because of their record. Um, they've already knocked off a couple of teams uh, uh, that went in there and didn't respect that. Fordham's not a great team, but you better play well. And I think if you defend and rebound, you'll probably be fine. Uh, the games that I think are going to be especially challenging are road games coming up. Uh, you know, the season, you know, we're getting down to the end here already. Um, but I think at Dayton, at VCU, uh, and then uh, then it looks like they'll be scheduling at St. Bonaventure. That's been one of those floater games mm -hmm. that a lot of leagues kind of uh, put under their schedule. Hey, you're going to play this team. We just don't know when. Um, the week before the conference tournament is kind of an open week, and I bet they put two or three games in that week, including at St. Bonaventure. So at St. Bonaventure, at Dayton, at VCU, those will be the games that might be the make or break games for the Billikens, assuming they handle their business elsewhere. At home, yeah. Hey, you know, it. it you, you mentioned St. Bonaventure. If you're trying to be safety conscious, maybe you leave the Billikens on the road, you play Bonaventure, and then you go into the tournament. Uh, you yeah. have maybe a base, a hotel base that you stay at and you bust back and forth to that, and that way you don't have to find yourself in various hotels or coming back and who knows what happens. But they are going to have it at the Barclays Center, I presume. They, that hasn't changed. The, no, the, the latest has been, but I, there hasn't been any news that I've been aware of since Richmond went back on pause. But they were gonna, they, they're not going to play at the Barclays Center. They're going to play in the city of Richmond, Virginia, hmm. and use two venues, University of Richmond and VCU. I can that live with the, that. Yeah. That was the plan. Um, and assuming Richmond gets off pause and remember there was, there was some touchy, uh, maybe some hurt feelings as the Billikens medical staff more or less challenged the university of Richmond COVID protocols. And, and good it for them. Out, and it turns out the slew medical staff was right because the very next day is when Richmond went on their pause, not trying to point fingers and make them out to be bad guys. They're not, it's a class program it's just what they were doing wasn't working. And uh, so hopefully they get that behind them. And and the plan to go to Richmond uh, uh, is is uh, uh, still on the board. But that that has been the plan. All right. We, we've had some basketball talk. You and I, I'm, I'm going to extend this and talk a little baseball here. How many cocktail napkins have you gone through as far as making lineups so far? You know, there are so many options. And. I'd love to visit with Mike Schilt because he probably leads the, the league already in, in cocktail napkin lineup. <laughs> I think the biggest question is who's the leadoff man? Yeah. Because Wong yeah. did enough last year to say, okay, yeah, he's our leadoff guy. Um, the only way I can couch it is to say if we were playing tomorrow, because I think performance should dictate 
performance in spring training to me will dictate who gets the first shot because I'm not going to, I'm not going to anoint anybody. The Cardinals have gotten in trouble. Yeah. In good point. Anointing mm-hmm. not to pick on anybody. He's our center fielder or other folks. I'm not anointing anybody except I know Arenado and Goldschmidt. Um, and Molina. They're, they're our guys. And hopefully they help, uh, put Carlson in a rocking chair either in front or in the middle of those two guys. So to me, if we were playing tomorrow, I'd probably go with Edmund, but you also have Bader and you also have, if you want Carlson, I think advanced metrics guy would guys would tell you, put your best guys up front and go Carlson Goldschmidt Arenado. I'm not willing to go that far early, but I wouldn't discount it eventually. You know, one one of the things that when Mike Schilt got here, a lot of speed, they stole a lot of bases, pushed the envelope, and and that's something they don't have as much of. Now, Tommy Edmond can steal a base, I think, if he gets in that situation, but they don't have that sort of base-stealing speed. But they do have smart base runners, and I'll start with Goldschmidt. Oh, yeah. And and, and Edmond is, too. I mean, they know how to go first or third. Uh, They know how to do the little things, and and maybe that's how they're going to beat teams. But I, I'll tell you the other thing, Bob, when it comes to the lineup is there are a couple of guys that have to shit or get off the pot this year. And, and Bader's one of them. I think O'Neal's in that category where, you know, right. we, we've seen enough of them where, and it, granted, it was only 60 games last year, but we, we're talking about guys going their fourth and fifth year with the ball club. And we keep, you know, bringing them along, but now it's time to actually get something going. But 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 the other concern I have is is the bench – and your lack of left-handed yeah. punch yep. because Matt Carpenter is going to probably be your first left-handed bat off the bench. And for a guy who's never been a pinch hitter or a guy who's coming to ball game late, this is going to be an adjustment for him. And I don't know who your middle infielder is going to be, especially who's going to play shortstop. Is it going to be Sosa? I, I don't know because I didn't see him play. He was the only guy that didn't play last year in the big mm-hmm. leagues. Yeah, it, it is going to be a challenge. And I think there are some individuals um, – that the spotlight's going to be on him. We go, I go back to Tommy Edmond. You know him. Um, you see him train and in spring training, he's a smart kid. Can he learn the plate discipline to take more walks? He loves to be on the attack, which we all love too, but lay off the alto queso. Hey, the high cheese, <laughs> son, you, you, you're not Nolan Arenado. You're not going to get one up in your eyes and hit it out of the ballpark. You're not going to do that. Or, or if you do one out of 20 times, that's not a good percentage. So can you learn date, uh, plate discipline? Harrison Bader, we've been asking for a couple of years. Can you learn to lay off the outside breaking ball? Or when you get an outside pitch, are you willing to hit it into right field? And, and you know what? I don't know. No, you're right. And, and the success Bader had is when he went to right center. Absolutely. You know, he got himself in trouble trying to pull the outside breaking ball, and either he missed it or he hit it to the second baseman. But when he was going to right center field, that's when he was his most effective. And, and at this point, you know, I, you hear all the stories. I'm, I've been in the cage. I'm doing this. I got a new swing. And enough. Go do it. Just go. The thing I, the go thing go I play. About, yeah. The thing I would say about Bader is, hey, look. He's jacked. He's a tremendous athlete, really strong. Everybody knows about his speed. And, hey, you want to hit home runs, right? Uh, chicks dig the long ball. We, we all get that. But if he establishes that he can go the other way, then they're going to come inside, and that's when, a, that's that's when, when you can turn on. take that mistake and put it out of the ballpark. You'll take your singular double to right, beg him to come in, dare him to come in, and then you hit it out. Then you become a complete hitter. Uh, I want to tell you who I, I always thought Bader could be, uh, not because he's white, but I thought he would be Bob Denier, a, a guy yeah. who, who was a good outfielder, had great speed, but made himself into a better hitter where you had to respect him uh, and had a pretty good career. But I, I think that uh, Bader is it could be that guy. But, it, you know, this is this is where he's got to do something because you got – Lane Thomas knocking at the door and we, and we don't know what he's going to look like. I thought COVID really took advantage of him last year. Boy, that was a uh, and, and it was really yeah. unfortunate, but you know, we're at a point now where if you expect to win 
and, and we're not talking about winning a division. You you want to be talking about playing in league championship, if not the World Series. You've got to have people play and, and do their job instead of holding on and experimenting. And, and I think Mike Schiltz at that point now where he's going to say, hey, look, if you can't do it, we got to find somebody else. I love hope, but hope is not a plan. Very good. I like that. It's, can I can I use that some? Maybe I'll ask. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll, I appreciate. How Put a Clay's online trademark on that. Because <laughs> you know how people are. Yeah. All right. Hey, listen, man. Always good to visit with you. By the way, there's absolutely nothing going on here in spring training. Uh, of course, the one person who's over there every day working with a few guys, Jose Okendo, saw him. Yeah. God, I love talking to the manager. The best. He is the best. Mike Schilt showed up today and, you know, he's getting things together. I, I will say this and talking to Schilt, ironically, as we were both driving to Florida at the same time in the middle of the night, we, he <laughs> called me and we talked for maybe 50, 100 miles about what spring training might look like. And because of the protocols in play, and this is where I think the Cardinals have a real advantage. They're going to use the 2.0 or the, the the summer spring training format that they had at Bush Stadium where guys would come in in different intervals. And, and they have a better understanding of how that works and how they can get work done and how guys can get their work in. And I think that's an advantage for them, for especially when you look at teams that are like, well, wait a minute, how are we going to do spring training? You know, we're used to having 70 guys here all at one time. Well, that's not going to happen. And that may be to the advantage of them as far as them getting off early yeah. and getting some things done. My only concern is, is there enough time to get this many pitchers ready to go? And, and they've be, got a lot of guys yeah. that can pitch. And, yeah. and as you know, Bob, you got to make sure guys have that comfort level of being ready. And maybe they leave some guys here to work on some things. You know, somebody's going to have an ouchie or a boo-boo. You know, that's going to happen. Yeah. But you might break camp with as good of a pitching staff as you could ever find, provided they get enough legitimate innings in. And I'm not talking about facing guys who wear 94 or 97 on their back. I'm talking about seeing some some guys who are working through some things themselves. Yeah, um, it will be interesting to see how they do that. And the, and the Cardinals have the kind of complex that they can use different areas for different things mm -hmm. and, um, and, and set up that kind of a schedule. The other thing I'm hopeful for, I saw Dr. Fauci yesterday talking about his hope was that, again, hope um, is that by April that everybody who wants a vaccine should be able to get one. And maybe that's where maybe spring training we're still really locked in and very, very cautious. But as we get this season going, the things will loosen up. And I know fans want to get back to the ballpark. So hopefully he's right. And uh, and the season can be closer to normal than we've seen. He's Bob Ramsey. I'm Mike Claiborne. We thank you for watching another edition of the podcast here on ClaibsOnline.com. Rammer, have a great weekend. And uh, let's get a few more Billiken wins under our belts. When does postseason play start, by the way? When does the tournament start? It starts that second weekend of March. Okay. That would be uh, that, that would be the conference tournament, the second weekend. Well, we got some work to do. He's Rammer. I'm Claves. We'll talk to you soon.